welcome to another addictive episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast with your host and sailing addict, David Howes. Hi folks and welcome along to another episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast. This week is episode 29 and it's uh, unlike the last two weeks of episodes which have been uh, two hours plus in length, uh, this one's uh, a bit shorter and sweeter, uh, so we'll get to that shortly. Firstly, uh, to some feedback this week. Uh, this one was a Facebook message from a listener called Linus Wilson. He sent me a message and said, I learned from the audio book that your boat is called Ocean Gem and not Ocean Jim. Uh, you talk funny. Uh, he said, I enjoyed the audio book. Thanks for the generosity you are showing to the podcast listeners. I know how expensive the content you are producing uh, for free is. So thanks, Linus, for your feedback and uh, it's always much appreciated. So October was a bit of a crazy month for me. I'm a little bit behind with the podcast show notes, so looking to get those up to date in the next uh, couple of weeks or so. I started October competing in the St. Helena Cup uh, on Moreton Bay uh, out of the Wynnum Manly Cruising Club, and that was spectacular with a fleet of 100 boats uh, on, on the harbour, and we had a, we had a great weekend. Uh, then I was off to India for a business trip for eight days, uh, and while I was away, uh, I received this uh, email in my inbox uh, saying I'd won a trip for two to Auckland to watch the All Blacks play the Wallabies uh, at Eden Park for their World Cup winning run with world record winning run. Um, I was about to delete it because I thought it was spam, and I uh, thought I'd double check, and much to my surprise, it was actually a trip for two to Auckland. Uh, so headed off to Auckland for four days, saw a fantastic game of rugby. Uh, well, the Rugby was probably a little bit average, but the result was fantastic. Um, and then straight back to the Gold Coast, where uh, we uh, then took uh, my boat Ocean Gem back up to Morden Bay for the Beneteau Cup and French Cups, which were competed over the weekend, uh, just finished uh, at the end of October. So that was a uh, spectacular weekend with 23 yachts competing in two different uh, divisions. Um, and we had a great regatta. regatta. Great result. Um, we tied for the Benito Cup, but came second on countback. But uh, I guess that's pretty fair given last year we also tied with the exact same boat for the title, and we won on countback. So it's a uh, it's good to share the uh, good to share the, the trophies around sometimes. So it was a spectacular weekend, and uh, and it reminded me how truly uh, amazing sailing can be when you have uh, perfect weather, ten to fifteen knots, sunny condition, conditions. A flat bay, lots of islands to navigate around, and a, and a really good bunch of uh, people in terms of the people running the regatta and, and the competitors in the regatta. So it's definitely one of our favourite events, and uh, it's worth a six-hour trip up to Morden Bay, um, up through the broad water and, and through the, all the shallow spots uh, to get there. And uh, it was a fantastic weekend of racing. So uh, we seem to be re seeing uh, record numbers of people walking in off the street uh, each week um, at the Southport Yacht Club looking to go sailing for the first time. I get a few emails from people around the country around how, how to get into sailing or how to get into a, how to get a start on a boat You know, at, at a yacht club they may not have been to before because maybe they're new to the area or new to sailing. And as always, my advice is just turn up at a yacht club, find out what day their twilight racing is, uh, ask if they know of anyone looking for a crew. Uh, in most cases, if you just turn up an hour beforehand on the day, there'll be somebody there looking for to match uh, boats with a crew. And, and before you know it, you do two or three races with somebody and you get along well, and, and then you get invited back to do uh, more and more racing and go offshore and go further afield. So great way to get started. Look up your, your local yacht club. Go to their website. There's often uh, crew want to notices there as well. Uh, contact the sailing manager, and you would be surprised at... Uh, how easy it is to get started in the the sport of sailing. So, if you thought about getting started, don't you know? Don't hesitate. Don't uh, wait till you've got more skills. Uh, wait till you've read more books or anything like that. Just just turn up, and you'll be amazing how fast you'll learn if you just uh, get started on board somebody's boat. Next, uh, I've received lots of requests and messages about an update on Andy Lamont. Uh, yes, Andy Lamont is in Sydney. Uh, he left the Gold Coast, started on started westbound on his. Uh, Solo circumnavigation, uh, headed south to Sydney, had uh, some pretty extreme weather, uh, had significant damage uh, to his furler, had electrical issues, had regulator issues, and, and a manufacturer's fault um, beyond his control in, in one of his electrical uh, charging systems. So he's uh, pulled into Sydney. He's undergone extensive repairs, which were, were prudent given he could not continue 
around the world uh, with electrical uh, charging and, and obviously Genoa further issues. Uh, and he's due to depart Sydney in about a week. And I just caught up with him this morning and he is uh, adjusting his world record attempt so that it's now departing Sydney, returning to Sydney, as opposed to uh, Gold Coast to Gold Coast, given the uh, three-week uh, stop he's had to t- make. Um, that was obviously unplanned. So you can follow Andy um, at andylamont.com.au uh, and on his website is a live tracker. Uh, that tracker shows him sitting in Sydney right now. But, but again, he'll be underway in about a week and you'll be able to see uh, his progress as he heads nonstop unassisted around the world uh, to complete his uh, world record attempt for a vessel under 40 foot in length. So thanks for all of your inquiries around Andy and um, check out his website. He's going to he has been updating his blog uh, and has got some updates there and he'll continue to update that. So uh, stay tuned and, and watch uh, Andy's progress um, through his site. And this week's episode is a little bit different. Uh, it's an interview with Mike Horn uh, of Mike Horn uh, Expeditions. Uh, Mike was recently off the coast of South Africa on his boat, Pangaea, and uh, one of my uh, crew members Spent some time on board with Mike on his expedition and, and convinced him to uh, put aside 15 minutes for a quick chat for the Ocean Sailing Podcast. And uh, Mike Horn, when you go to his website at mikehorn.com, has got quite an amazing background in terms of the things he's done over uh, the past two decades. Mike Horn's globally acknowledged as the world's greatest modern day explorer from swimming the Amazon River, solo and unsupported, to an unmotorized circumnavigation of the globe at the equator. In the last two decades, he's seen more of the Earth than possibly any other human. He's walked to the North Pole during the dark season. He's scaled the world's 8,000 meter peaks, including a recent attempt to paraglide K2. And during his Arctos expedition, he walked the Arctic Circle solo and was already dreaming of his next expedition. He built a 4 by 4 of the sea in his mind, and over the next two plus years of walking on the ice in minus 60 degree weather, Panagea was born. And in 2008, Mike embarked on an expedition plan that served as a great platform for young adults to be able to experience and explore the natural world all over. Mike's completed more than 200,000 miles in multiple circumnavigations, and they are well documented as an environmental initiative to educate a global network of youth. He now has several new projects on the horizon. They are bigger and more inspiring than ever. So I recommend that you check out mycorn.com at some point. Um, it's a fascinating website. The guy's an amazing adventurer. Uh, and, and some of the things he's done over the last 20 years really are quite fascinating. And some of the photos are just incredible. So... Enjoy this week's episode with Mike Horn from MikeHorn.com, interviewed by Shea Lachlan. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast. My name is Shia and I'll be your guest host today. We have a very special guest this week. Let me introduce world-renowned explorer Mike Horn. He is a 50-year-old South African-born explorer who once swam the length of the Amazon River alone. Then he became the first person to walk to the North Pole in winter and alone. At the moment, he is on his wildest expedition to, to date. It's called Pole to Pole. I caught up with Mike in Cape Town in South Africa for an interview, and he'll tell you more about it. Here it is. Hope you enjoy. So the Pole to Pole expedition is a combination of uh, acquired knowledge through 25 years of exploration. Um, and the idea was to circumnavigate the world crossing both poles. Um, and I had my sailing vessel Pangaea, that's like a four-wheel drive of the ocean that can go up the Amazon, go into polar regions, um, it, can, it can go into the ice and even break a little bit of ice. So um, everything that I did as an explorer for 25 years kind of was pieces I needed to do this big expedition. And um, I decided not to follow 
uh, a certain longitude around the world, but to go to interesting places around the world. So I went, I left Monaco and then um, spent two and a half months in the Namib Desert and then went into Botswana, into uh, the swampy areas of Africa, uh, all in preparation to be able to cross Antarctica. And the first big challenge would be to cross the South Pole. So I would leave with my boat from Cape Town. Uh, it would take me about two weeks to sail down to Antarctica. And then the boat will drop me off um, on, on the continent. And then meet me four and a half months later on the other side. So the boat will then sail uh, around Antarctica towards New Zealand and Australia where it will be waiting for me. So while the boat um, gets ready uh, in Australia to, to sail back to Antarctica, I have the time to cross. Yeah. So um, it, it would be the first ever full crossing of Antarctica on its widest part. Yeah. And it would be done unsupported uh, and solo. So I'll have the support of, of kites to be able to, to um, pull me across Antarctica because of the distance that you have to cover that's over 8,000 kilometers. Um, you need to do days up to 500 kilometers because we're not always going into, in a straight line. It depends on where the yeah. wind comes from. Uh, so that would be my next big challenge is to be able to go down there and uh, yeah, try and make it to the other side before it freezes up. Because yeah. I can go only when the ice melts to be able to approach the continent. And then I've got to get across Antarctica before it freezes up on the other side. And as we all know, summers down uh, in Antarctica uh, becomes very short. So they've got three months of summer. And I actually need four and a half months to cross. So it's going to be a race against time. And yeah. from there on, I will then uh, take my boat uh, where they'll pick me up and sail to New Zealand and Australia where we'll do some environmental projects and uh, just um, get the young explorers uh, involved in projects for them to be able uh, as well to, to be part of, of this expedition and to live, live an expedition that wouldn't that would inspire them to do uh, different other projects around the world. Uh, then I'll head up through uh, Papua New Guinea. Uh, I might stop over in India, do a couple of 7,000 meter peaks, virgin peaks um, that, that, that haven't been climbed before, and then get back on the boat, sail via Japan into the Bering Straits. And then I will try and cross Antarctica in the summer. So. It's going to be a little bit different than, than what I did before because I, cr I went to the North Pole in winter in complete darkness yeah. when the ice becomes solid. But now as the ice will be breaking up in the summer, it's going to make for an interesting expedition because you've got a lot of open water. And as we know, Antarctica is a continent and the Arctic or the North Pole is only ice floating on top of water. Uh, that's going to make it quite interesting. So I've got to work out a way by using a kayak uh, and not only a sled to be able to cross open water and to be able to find solid enough ice to pitch my tent. And the crossing would be done from the Bering Strait uh, all the way up via the North Pole uh, to the northern tip of Greenland. Uh, there we've got a different problem as well because there's a lot of ice drift that comes down the east coast of Greenland that I don't drift off into uh, the Atlantic Ocean before I get to the other side. So I need a little bit of luck and good weather conditions to be able uh, to get me on the other side. And if ever I start drifting, that I would have Pangaea, my boat, and to be able to get me. This boat, how much did, like, what was the process of getting it? built or was it like did you tell the architects that's something that you wanted to do or how, how, how did it come about? You know Pangaea was a boat um, that was built purposely to be able to go to places that not a lot of boats could go to and as it's kind of a unique vessel uh, that allows us to carry quite a lot of people to be able to go into the ice and to be able to to have retractable keels and retractable rudders um, I was looking at a vessel that 
could take me anywhere in the world. And I was inspired uh, by boats uh, that Sir Peter Blake, when he got shot in, in the Amazon, had. Uh, I spoke to quite a lot of naval engineers and architects to be able to, to find a solution for everything that I thought would be a problem. And uh, that's how the boat was, was born. And how did you even get into sailing? I mean, you were, you were in the army. What, when was the point? Like, when did you first get on the boat? Uh, the first time I got on the boat was um, as, alone, was during my expedition uh, called Latitude Zero, where I followed the equator right around the world. And what was interesting is that I worked on boats before as a deckhand, but I never steered a boat or never had yeah. to set a sail. Mm -hmm. And because I was doing a lot of paragliding, I under understand the shape of a wing, um, I understand wind flow, uh, and and the the basic respect for the winds according to the size of the sails. And if you understand one thing about sailing is you you have two things that changes. It's the boat speed changes and the angle of the wind changes. So if you can optimize the angle of the wind and the boat speed uh, towards where you want to go then you know the basics of sailing and for me it's 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 kind of trial and error so I make a lot of mistakes before I get something right and if you live through all the mistakes that you make uh, and then do something right that is lived experience and yeah. as we know knowledge Knowledge is really uh, the power you need to be able to do things and make decisions. And, and you're on your way to Antarctica, obviously there's a lot of preparations going around the expedition, but also from a sailing point of view, you've got about a month till you head off. What are some of the things that you have to get ready to make sure that that journey is safe and that you get what you want out of it? You know, because there's a lot of unknown, uh, we, we, t we try and, and, and imagine uh, problems before they actually happen. And to be able uh, to have a boat uh, that's well maintained, I think, is the first uh, big thing that you can do or change as a skipper of a vessel. Uh, for us to be able to to have the engines, the sails, uh, the the systems, hydraulic systems, electrical systems on the boat function well, um, would would make the trip a little bit safer. But more than that, you need crew. On board the boat. How did you choose your crew? What what sort of made you go with the people that you do go? With? I, I think it's it's a it's a gut feeling that we have as as uh, as as adventurers uh, or, or explorers, and if you uh, see or find people that that thinks a little bit more positive and don't only see all the problems but see solutions, uh, then I tend to want to go with with people like that and then there's a respect and trust that you have to have in your within the crew if you can't trust somebody then how can you respect that person and to be able to not all want to be the captain on the boat but to be able to help the boat reach its destination is a certain attitude that we as human beings can change and to have the people with the the, the right attitude and the energy to go with that attitude then you can be crew of this vessel and it's quite easy to find people that would either be have the right attitude but not enough energy uh, then it's obviously a recipe for disaster you need to be able uh, to, to be in sync with each other so that we can function as a tight unit because we really re rely on each other and and what do you think will be the biggest challenge sailing to Antarctica you know that when you go down into the roaring 40s and the 50s and the screaming 60s, um, the big challenges as we, we get closer to Antarctica obviously would be uh, the icebergs. Uh, we don't always see the icebergs or the, the what they call them, the growlers that's underneath the ocean. And uh, if you sail along at 12, 14 knots in, in very strong winds, and you hit one of these these pieces of ice that might be the size of the boat, 
uh, the ice is going to be harder than the boat and it's going to sink the boat. So to be alert and be awake in, in extreme cold and uncomfortable conditions would be one of my biggest challenges. So yet again, we can be prepared for that. And that's where you have to really look at the clothing uh, that, that the crew members wear, that they stay dry but warm. And if you dry and warm and you eat enough, uh, then you can fight the conditions for a little bit longer. And we're all going to be tired. And to be able to accept that part of the strip is an adventure and there's going to be very little sleep, uh, the salaries are very low uh, and return is not always certain. If you understand those three things, then, you know, it makes the trip safe. And what do you, is there anything that you're really looking forward to for the, for the 12 days that it will take you? You know, the sailing part's always the interesting part and that's what... Why is that? Because you, you cover big distance without really uh, uh, an enormous amount of energy spent. So you stay awake, yes, there's mental fatigue, but the sailing part is part of the relaxing uh, and the boat takes you to your destination. And it's always exciting for me to leave land and then to move towards where, you know, you want to go. And even though I've been to Antarctica before uh, and I sailed in close to the peninsula and tried to get as far down south as possible, we meet different obstacles and that's why sailing is interesting. Sailing is not only a sport we do when it's good weather. Uh, if you can sail in all weather conditions and add ice to that, then it becomes an interesting thing to do. Uh, are there any lessons that have particularly stuck with you through all these years of sailing? Things are, any you know, particular moments that... Particular moments, you know, we've been in this, uh, close to Japan during the tsunami, we've been in typhoons, we've been in tropical storms. As with this boat, we've sailed 12 times around the, the world with this boat. Um, the boat has proven uh, to work. So yeah. we've got our base that's quite solid. Mm -hmm. And if you have a solid base and the crew with experience that sailed with me around the world, then you've got a very good chance of making it. So those little things, you know, even during the tsunami, uh, not to want to go any closer to, to land, but to, to opt out and go into the ocean where you're much safer, might sound like a problem, but that's where you find the solution. And, um, you know, in, 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 um, in, in typhoons and tropical storms, you have to, you have to respect nature. And there's moments that sometimes it's better to turn back and sail away from where you want to go and then die sailing towards where you want to go. And I think that is, that is some of the, the biggest challenges is sometimes to make the call to turn back and run with the wind even if you're not going in the right direction. Yeah. And I just have one last question. Um, what would be your advice? Do you have any advice for, for the sailing community out there? You know, say, any, any advice that you might have gotten over your years that you want to pass on? I, I, I think people always underestimate their own uh, knowledge and power. It's, it's sure that we, we sometimes think that it will be worse. And if we always see um, <clears throat> the worst in, 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 in what can happen, um, even if we imagine a scenario that the boat might go down, and that stops us from going out there, that's a mistake. You know, there's, there is a solution to many problems. And for us to be able to still go out there and explore as, an, uh, as a sailor and be disciplined and have the boat well prepared, a boat rarely really goes down. And a lot of times, you know, we, we, we might think that this is the end, but... It's never the, <clears throat> never the end until it's the end. Yeah. Sometimes the end is just imaginary. Cool. Is there anything else that you want to add or maybe I haven't... No, I think that, you know, people have to understand that one life has 30,000 days and each one of those days count and we've got to live our life to the fullest of our potential and to be able to go out there and sail um, gives you a lot of freedom because you're moving away from people, you're moving to, towards freedom 
where you're not policed or nobody makes the decisions for you. To be out there on the ocean, to me, is the ultimate way of living a life where you are responsible of the, the, the decisions that you make. And that is what I love about sailing. Sailing gives you that freedom to discover who you really are. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast. Email your comments and suggestions to david at oceansailingpodcast.com.au. See you next week. Sometimes I wonder how they've lived a life like this before Some are just so damn young So turn around and hear them speak So turn around and help them out Turn around cause you're watching them Watching some getting ready to die Then knocked down to the ground and can't get back up Feelings are sad, I want to be mad Days here are like precious gold If you live another one, you have faith to carry on So turn around Turn around and help them out Turn around cause you're watching them cry And watching some getting ready to die The memory of their courage is taped in my head It plays a soft I painted a picture of the past I picture cold, dark sand and skies I painted the future how it's supposed to be With warm sun in a bright town So turn around and hear them speak So turn around Some getting rid